us for the health tech breakfast. Um, try to make this as pleasant as possible. Hope you're enjoying your breakfast. Um, our topic today is 3D health, data, decisions, and dollars. Where are the new opportunities for entrepreneurs, patients, and payers that are being spurred by technology, innovation, and analytics in health? And some of the things that we're going to uh, explore is what is the impact of big data within health where the opportunities are huge due to the massive digitization of medical records and the extent and speed of penetration by mobile devices. As you know, um, there's 17,000 apps now in health uh, that are available and something like 40% of physicians have iPads or say they want to use iPads uh, during their practice. Um, and then uh, what are the financial incentives incentive changes that are available for companies that know how to tie big health data to health decisions. Um, we have our distinguished panelists here and they're going to help us address some of these questions. I will introduce them. Uh, first we have uh, Vineet Gulati, who's founder and CEO of Health Expense. Niraj Katwala, CTO Healthline Networks. Chris Hogg, co-founder 100 Plus. Ibor Rastogi, who's the director at Intel Capital, and I will let each of these distinguished panelists uh, give a little bit of their background and acquaint us with themselves. Can we start with you, Vinny? Please. Uh, sure. I thought we were going to start from the other side. <laughs> Does it work now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I'd have to scream across the room. So. Hi everybody, I'm Vineet Gulati. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Health Expense. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about individual companies later, but my background is in pharmaceutical and healthcare going back 18 years. Um, before I started Health Expense, I used to run a, a, the pharma and healthcare practice for a company called Capgemini, which is a large uh, global management consulting business. Uh, spent uh, well over 10 years there, built their practice uh, all across the West and US region. Um, and then sort of uh, what I call at that time looked like professional suicide was give up a large comfortable job and start uh, a small company all by myself and uh, so I started Health Expense about two years ago and uh, we really uh, focus on working with the third party administrators, uh, care teams that are engaged with large or mid-sized employers and focus on enabling the employees to get access to uh, really good health care um, all across the spectrum from when they should get care to where they should go for uh, good care in terms of quality and outcomes to really managing the day-to-day -day <clears throat> emphasis on cost reimbursement. So we'll uh, touch on that you know, through our conversations today. Hi, I'm Chris Hogue. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called 100 Plus. Uh, my background is really, uh, I come from a data analytics background. So before starting 100 Plus, I had worked uh, for a company called CV Therapeutics um, out in Palo Alto and then uh, through and then Gilead Sciences after CV was acquired. And there I um, was in a group called Commercial Strategy where I ran the cardiovascular commercial strategy group. And our job was to look at, um, at data, talk to doctors a lot, and try to understand what was happening in our markets and how they were evolving. Um, and really to put together um, different sources of data, RX data, claims data, surveys that we would do um, into, into a story of what was happening and then use that to try to design clinical trials and, and um, position, our, position our products. Um, over the last few years, I've become really interested in, the, in new sources of data that are coming in, um, electronic medical record data, um, passive data that we collect about our behaviors and our, and our bodies through devices like Fitbit or our phones or our sleep data and became really interested in how to use that data and analytics at the core to try to create a consumer experience, try to engage people with their health and help them understand their behaviors and how their behaviors impact health and really start to weed through the, the overload of information that's gonna start coming about, about our health and about our bodies. Um, and uh, we started up in, in October of last year. Um, just use this one. Hello? No. Yep, it's yeah. Hi, I'm Neeraj Kartwala. I work for Healthline Networks. I'm the CTO there. Um, Healthline Networks is uh, 
The current incarnation of the company is about seven years. Uh, in 2005, we relaunched. Prior to that, it was called Intermap Systems. Um, uh, we're based in San Francisco, about 150 people. Uh, investors include uh, GE is an investor, Aetna Kaiser, um, Reed Elsevier, I don't know if you guys know who Reed Elsevier is, but they are the largest publishers um, of medical content. They own 30% of the medical content uh, in the world. Grey's Anatomy, uh, so very well known. They own that. Um, they are, um, and at the heart of what we do, we have a core search engine and a semantic taxonomy in the healthcare space, um, which allows you to map things like diseases to drugs and drugs to treatments and uh, physician specialties to treatments and things like that. Um, on top of that, we have built a vertical search engine uh, and then we have branched out into several other areas like um, decision support, analytics like Chris was mentioning over here. Um, and uh, some of our largest, Yahoo Health is a good example of what we do. Uh, if you go to Yahoo Health, the entire Yahoo Health portal is powered by Health9. Um, so Yahoo doesn't do anything on that portal, we do. Um, so so uh, a vertical search engine with, a, an, with an underlying taxonomy, uh, powering consumer-facing websites for um, direct-to-consumer and for enterprise clients. That's what Healthline was basically. Great. Uh, thanks, Neeraj. Uh, also wanted to congratulate Neeraj for bringing all the different parties in healthcare together, which I think is a feat in itself. If you were able to get Aetna, Kaiser, GE, everybody to work together, I think that's sort of the reform we all need. Uh, so we were restocking with Intel Capital. Uh, I'm an investment director in our Santa Clara office. Uh, Intel Capital, as the name suggests, we are the corporate venture arm of Intel. Uh, have been in business since 91. Uh, so since inception, I've invested close to $10 billion in startups. In a given year, we invest anywhere from $300 million to $500 million in new deals. So last year, we invested over $500 million in over uh, 100 deals. Um, we had about 30 exits last year, so 30 of our companies were either acquired or went public. So pride ourselves on a, on a good track record um, for, for having been around this long. Um, as far as uh, our, our philosophy in investing, we are very global. So we think there is a, a massive GDP shift that's happening, uh, and uh, and some of it is actually, frankly, related to related to healthcare, uh, related to some of the healthcare policies in the United States, which is letting people to go outside the United States just for uh, creating jobs there because healthcare costs here are so onerous. So we have also shifted our investment dollars outside the United States, and half of our uh, dollars are are uh, invested in about forty countries. Uh, so we are in a lot of the frontier economies as well, not just in the uh, developed economies. Um, I personally invest in uh, vertical markets, healthcare being one of them. I'm on the board of a company, CareCloud, in South Florida. They are in the practice management, revenue cycle management, electronic medical record space, uh, and happy to get into that. And in general, our healthcare portfolio includes companies like Pacific Bio, includes Vocera, which just filed to go public. Uh, as well as a number of others, and happy to get into those details as well. <coughs> Thank you, Igor. Um, let me start with our first question, and uh, I'm going to address that to Chris. Um, Chris, how are companies using the potential of analytics to build new business models in healthcare, and what success do they have? Um, so the way the way I see it, I mean, I think it's interesting because obviously health healthcare has always been a, a data business, and and the way I, I sort of start to see or to hope things will will evolve is anytime we see you know pools of data come into the healthcare system, claims data or RX data, you see um, an industry or a small group of companies that that analyze that data for certain purposes. And Genix is a really good example, you know, of, of using. Uh, data from the back. I mean, healthcare has been a big data industry for a long time. As you know, what the quality or the use of that data, I guess. And so now that we have these new sources of data that I think are far more interesting than what we've had before, like electronic medical record data, where um, even though based based around claims and billing for a lot of doctors, at least it's all centered around one unit, which is the patient. And 
Um, my one of the th one of the sources that we use is um, electronic medical record data from a company called Practice Fusion, and I'm just um, always impressed at how interesting that data is when it's all linked back and the things that you can tell with with data in that volume. And so I think you'll we'll start to see those those data stores or those data centers um, evolve as as a sort of platform where we'll be able to bolt new services and analytic tools on top of them. So we'll have people that will be analyzing data to improve, improve care. We'll have people that are analyzing data um, to show physicians more information, give them more data about how they're practicing. Um, there's a company in, in this uh, health accelerator called Rock Health, right now called EpiMD, that's trying to do that. Um, they'll be, I think, more in the standard mold mode of helping um, insurance companies better understand their patient populations and uh, pharma better understand their, their patient populations, companies like Humedica. Uh, I, um, and then there's gonna be, I think we'll start to see companies, um, we're, we're in, this, in this game also, that will try to analyze the data for a different purpose and finally start using the data to turn back for consumers and, and help consumers do things. And it might be, it might be choice of, of products or um, it might be, um, it might be big to compete to show them prices, or it might be to help them understand themselves or, or their behaviors. There's another company that I really like that spun out of MIT Media Lab called Ginger IO that is helping analyze data that just comes out of your cell phone, you know, sensor data, the accelerometer, GPS, SMS. They actually do this very clever thing where um, your phone gets Bluetooth bounces, you know, if other phones are around, so it can tell if you're in a solitary environment or in a social environment. Um, things, there's, there's all of this, this, and it has to be processed. And, and so it will be processed back for the physician, I think, um, in useful ways where it's not telling them what to do, but they're just, doctors are very data-driven to begin with, so it's gonna be a new tool. Um, and, then, and then back to consumers to help them uh, make better choices. And those, those could be behavioral choices, physician selection choices. Um, and to date, I think that the, the ones that have had probably the most uh, success, at least in this new game, have been some of the ones who are going to, um, doing traditional analytics, uh, but with better data. So I really, you know, Humedic has another example, uh, Explorasys. These, these companies, a lot of them came out of, you know, Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic, where they were already doing this internally, and now they're, they're doing it more broadly. Um, but, but kind of using, using the data to um, improve, improve care, improve practice patterns. I think the, new, the newer models um, that we're in are still evolving for sure. And I think that it's a it's, it's a brand new time. I talked to a lot of a lot of companies who are, are starting to do this or think about this uh, this new wave of, of of this new wave of analytics companies basically um, to kind of process the, in, the overload that's going to come. But I, I do think it's it's still evolving, and we'll see kind of how how it all shakes out. Thank you. My next. Thank you, Chris. Uh, my next question is, um, I'm gonna direct that to Niraj. How can big data increase transparency and become a powerful tool to help patients make better healthcare buying decisions? So when the, the, when the industry and uh, industry experts use the term transparency, uh, they are primarily talking about cost and quality transparency in treatment care options. That's the biggest thing. So um, so there are three primary treatment option providers. There are doctors, there are hospitals, uh, and then there are labs and whatnot, right? So those are the three uh, major uh, provider segments in the industry. It's the healthcare industry. The issue with the healthcare industry, it's not like buying cars, right? So you cannot just go and put up whatever information, ratings, J.D. Edwards. There's a lot of issues with saying this doctor is bad or this our doctor is good or this hospital is bad. However, um, the, it, there is a shift happening. So if you look at uh, the biggest source of free data, so if you really want to start a company, I think there is a good, good, uh, good thing here, but uh, uh, there's a huge amount of, there's one piece of data which is very unique, uh, which is Medicare data. So that's government data. It's owned by the government. And the government realizes that this is something which you can 
put up on the web, make available for entrepreneurs, companies to use. So they have started putting up a lot of government Medicare data on the web. And uh, there are organizations like the CMS, AHRQ, Medicare.gov. You can go to and you can start fetching all this information. This is a huge amount of information. Um, and it gives you uh, cost transparency on different procedures like knee replacement surgery or uh, cabbage, uh, you know, quadruple bypass or anything like that. You can actually get information on what it costs to perform a knee replacement surgery in this zip code, in this hospital, right? And then for all the hospitals in the US, the government has started collecting quality data in terms of what was the length of stay of a person in the hospital, um, you know, how, you know, how, how did the patients, you know, there is an exit interview which is conducted for patients by most hospitals and most organizations. How did the individual patient, patients feel the um, overall services were? What was the success rate? What was the readmission rate? Like, did the guy come back in three months saying, hey, you didn't solve anything? You know, those kind of things, right? So there is a tremendous amount of data which the government is sitting on, which they are releasing. Uh, so how does this help an average consumer is the question, right? So uh, Chris just mentioned Ingenix. So Ingenix is, a, is, is an aggregator of doctor information data. And um, they collect um, you know, addresses, phone numbers, uh, what not, like sp you know, what are the specialties that the doctor. So that database, and if you combine that database, there is no such thing that the government provides, but different organizations like AMA and all, they have that, or, or is it the American, uh, you know, th there are a few organizations which provide listings of doctors across the country. There are other organizations, uh, there are a couple of companies, Health Grades is an example, Vitals is an example, who have started doing two things. They've started allowing doctors to make changes to their profile, uh, but also they have started collecting feedback from patients as to how their experience with the doctor was. Um, so now you collect that quality data, which is you know how the patient fared with that doctor. You collect the hospital quality data. You collect the cost data you know, of a surgery or a procedure performed at a hospital. You are now getting a very rich set of data um, across the healthcare industry. This is like the price of a guy. Most of us don't ever look at what, what it really costs. Uh, we, we have insurance, we have better things to do. We, we shouldn't be doing that, but that is how it, the mentality is nowadays. Uh, but what has happened is there's a lot of reform which has been happening and that reform is forcing the health plans to actually take a very close look at the cost of their operations, right? So they cannot just go and pay out arbitrary amounts of money for different procedures. And there is a real serious uh, curve. So there are hospitals which charge $5,000 for, for a procedure and there are hospitals which charge $20,000 for a procedure. So when the health plan looks at what is my profitability or what is our profitability at a $20,000 level versus a $5,000 level, right? And then they look at the difference in quality between the $5,000 hospital and the $20,000 hospital. They see it's not that much, like it's a 2%, 3% difference maybe in quality, right? Or maybe at times the $5,000 hospital is actually better and doing, you know, depending on the zip code they are in. So what they are trying to come up is plans which will, which will they, which they will then give to the consumers that hey, we will pay you eight thousand dollars, right, for a colon, you know, for a cabbage or whatever the procedure is. You want to go to a twenty thousand dollar hospital? Be my guest. But the twelve thousand dollars, that's your, you know, it's out of your pocket. Uh, we won't pay more than that. So now, that plan means that the consumer now has to look at which hospital he goes to and what that hospital is potentially going to charge or what that doctor is going to charge him. So,
marketing now at that time the the, the consumer is going to be like okay i want to go to the best hospital or the best doctor which gives me $8000 worth of service uh, i'm not just going to go to the closest hospital because hey i'm not going to get a cabbage 10 times in my life i mean uh, i'm going to get it once so i better do it right the first time so and i don't want to break the bank in doing that so so that that is happening okay it's not happening as fast as we would all love it to happen but it is happening and the more quickly more quickly that that quality and cost transparency for doctors physicians labs happens the better for consumer so that's Does anybody want to add to that or So I think uh yeah um just to go quickly add to that um I think one of the problems we have um with healthcare cost and transparency in general is there are two real systems in healthcare one that you and I typically think of about healthcare which is our relationship with our doctor our relationship with our hospital um or if you can call it a relationship our need in terms of getting good healthcare and then um that puts you in the decision seat saying where do I go for uh, getting good healthcare once that happens then you have the second system that kicks in which is all about costs all about money all about reimbursements and payments and uh that particular system has way more players in it than you and I can ever imagine um you have the insurance company you have the administrators you have the employers and it really puts you right at the end so the reason for mentioning that in terms of terms of transparency is that most of us have historically not cared about costs why because we never really paid for it um it was something that our employers took care of um, we paid our standard 10 dollars 20 dollars now paying more doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to create transparency by itself so one of the things that uh, when we start to compare quality and cost and we do this for employers um when we roll out our solution is that you have to then also start to figure out the cost that you would pay based on your condition so specifically if uh what kind of condition what kind of care history you've had so the cost of a cabbage will change if you're on your first procedure or you're actually having a second procedure or god forbid if you're having a third procedure i actually went through this with my own father who actually flew in from india and i had to call stanford i had to call ucsf and say he's having his third bypass what's the cost difference and there was an order of magnitude 40% cost difference between the first and the third bypass um so the your own condition matters a lot in terms of what transparency needs to be so adjusting it for severity is one of the critical things that we have not yet started to do what we're really doing is what if if you thought uh, about using air travel and you went to kayak and said well i need to go from san francisco to uh, to new york and kayak came back and said well it'll be like 300 to 600 dollars you can go and figure it out but what you really do this day i need to travel between 6 and 9 am i need to travel by economy which most of us do um or um i need to travel non stop and that really adjusts it based on your personal need and i think with transparency we're only now scraping the surf- surface to see how we can actually provide really true meaningful information to uh to me as an individual to you as a patient or, in, or as a consumer that adjust it for your own personal condition that's a very very critical goal for transparency itself so thank you <coughs> thank you vinny um my next question is to vibor um how will the intersection of genomics and big data change drug dis- uh, drug discovery in medicine sure before i take that um, i guess just a quick show of hands how many people here think that uh, the individual mandate that the supreme court is deliberating on will stay or or will it be okay so just one person that's it so everybody thinks that will be shot down uh, very interesting yeah just just curious because uh, i think that will have a, a big effect on 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 
you know the healthcare costs and healthcare reform and everything else. So just wanted to see kind of where the audience stood on that. Yeah, as far as uh, big data and genomics, uh, you know, we we are we are very very bullish from an investment perspective on that trend. Uh, as I mentioned, we were investors in Pack Bio, which was sort of on the upfront uh, portion of that sequencing uh, sequencing um, uh, workflow. And uh, the cost of se sequencing has, has come down by a factor of 800 just in the last four years. How many people here, by the way, are in the biotech space? So uh, shout out to those here who, who represent biotech. Uh, I think it's phenomenal uh, progress uh, in the last four years. You know, if you look at computing costs, which Intel with Moore's law has, has been behind, they've come down by a factor of 4x over the same period. So, so sequencing costs, the, the, the holy grail here is, can you get sequencing to be done below $1,000? And that's when, if you can sequence a full human genome at $1,000 or less, it just opens this whole new way of, for, for both researchers and clinicians to be able to diagnose diseases, to be able to, to uh, prescribe uh, drugs based on, on, on not just clinical uh, uh, history, but also their genetic predisposition. So we are looking at a number of companies in that space uh, that are taking all the sequence data and then that they're mining them for, for, uh, for, uh, for drug discovery as well as for, for clinical decision making. And I think this will be the, the trend that will uh, change medicine and, 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 and drug discovery in, in the 21st century. So, uh, and it's a very compute intensive problem. So as Intel, you know, we, we think that this is, uh, uh, this is going to be very critical. Our compute uh, expertise is, is critical to how this industry uh, actually moves forward. So, so we are personally quite bullish on it. Can I follow up a little bit on that? Um, what about other <coughs> areas uh, in HC analytics that uh, um, investors are investing in? Yeah, so uh, so another area that I think we are we are very excited about is uh, which is related to healthcare reform is this notion of accountable care organizations. How many people here have heard of ACOs? Great. So so pretty much everybody here, and and I think that will open up this whole new wave of analytics that some of my uh, fellow panelists have been talking about because there'll be this consolidation of providers buying up other providers, providers collaborating with other providers and peers also starting to get into this game by acquiring providers. So as I was congratulating Neeraj, in, in the past, Aetna had no incentive to work with, say, a Kaiser, or you know, for a Kaiser to work with another healthcare entity. These, they are all these healthcare silos. And for the first time, we're gonna tie incentives and payments to these accountable care organizations. And you will need all this layer of analytics sitting on top of ACOs that's tracking patients as they move from entity to entity, as well as dollars, uh, because you, ultimately you need to be able to reimburse people for the care that was delivered to them, and if there were any cost savings, they go back to this accountable care organization. So ACO is one trend that we are very excited about. Telemedicine is another one, uh, and analytics around telemedicine that we, we, we are very excited about, because again, you know, if, if the costs keep escalating as they have been, at three times the cost of GDP, and healthcare now being 16% of GDP, there is no way, and, and with, the, uh, with the baby boomer population uh, increasing by 2x in the next 10 years, there is no way that we can keep the same access uh, to healthcare without changing how we deliver healthcare. So we would want patients to be more at home in, in their home environment and deliver care to them in their home environment. So, so telemedicine and being able to remotely monitor these patients care for these patients, perhaps for a caregiver to, to have a dialogue with these patients at home, and for them to not come to the hospital if they don't need to. And, and then analytics you know, that are automated. So if you, know, if you are at home and you know, your, your grandfather perhaps is at home and they go on and step on a, on a, on a they, they go take their weight, they maybe take their, uh, their, their blood pressure, and that is automatically transmitted to an EMR system that has alerts built in, which flags a caregiver if there is, there, is some, there is something that's off, right? So that's more proactive versus reactive, which then obviously drives up the cost of healthcare. So, so telemedicine is an area that we are, we are quite uh, uh, interested in as well. And the third was which Chris touched upon, the whole notion of quantified self. So with, with all these devices, all these sensors, transmitting data that you, know, that you can be sending to EMRs, 
that uh, for, for both health, wellness, as well as for disease management, I think that's going to be a, a, a huge trend uh, that uh, will, will change uh, some of the, the chronic diseases that, uh, that frankly are self-inflicted, right? You know, obesity is a self-inflicted uh, disease that, that uh, you know, drives up, is hundreds of billions of dollars of care is delivered because people are, are just not conscious of what they're eating and how much they're exercising. So this notion of quantified self uh, and, and tied to incentives, uh, I, think, I think would be another big trend uh, that we are uh, investing in. Thank you, Igor. Um, Chris, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just wanted to actually ask a question more on the genomics uh, and leading to drug discovery and what you got, what your view is on on timing. You know, we, we talked a lot about this when I was in, at Gilead and at CBT, and it you know it's very interesting. I'm a I started out as a biologist. I'm a data geek. I love this stuff, but I just could never figure out the incentives. Why? How will this happen? And, and when will it happen? I mean, one example was there was a company we looked at called Arca that had done a, a heart failure trial with a beta blocker, and it failed, but they had, they had taken, it was Merck, and they had taken um, DNA data, they had taken genetic data, and it was great. And this company, Arca, bought the rights, and they had done this wonderful analysis and showed that they could bucket people into three groups, one of which actually had an increased risk of death. And so they went, and one of them had hyper responders. They did very, very well. And so they went to FDA with this data, and of course, FDA said, that's really wonderful, go do a prospective 5,000 person study. And so they, you know, they had to do that. And so even if we had genomic data linked to an EMR and we had all of these great hypotheses, which is where I think the real benefit is, you know, it's still, even if everything goes smoothly, I mean, it's 10 years, it's seven years, you know, to work through the, the, this, the development process and, uh, and the clinical trial process, or at least how I see it. And I, you know, there's no incentive for, for a Pfizer or for Gilead to go back and restudy drugs that are already out there unless FDA did something clever, you know, like they did with pediatric exclusivity or something, you know, genomic, you know, they gave some incentive. I just, I'd be curious to hear your perspective on that. Um, no, I, I agree, Chris. I mean, this is, uh, you know, this is a, a long-term trend, uh, but I think, you know, the, the critical factor, which I think has not been present in the past, is the fact that now the costs have come to the point where you can actually do a lot deeper analysis on on some of this genetic data. So so I completely agree uh, that this is this is somewhat not you know this is not where you know in the next three years we'll see you know a, a new drug that's coming out specifically based on this. But but I think some of the pieces are starting to fall in place. To your point, uh, the the first one is cost of sequencing, and the second is cost of drug discovery. So you know it used to be I was just chatting with the gentleman here about cost of, uh, of, of drug discovery and used to be a billion dollars and now it's escalating to a couple of billions of dollars. You know, all the, all the big pharma, most of their blockbuster drugs like Alipitor, they're going off patent and so they have to find new drugs and find them faster and, and, and perhaps uh, ones that work on a smaller population set than what they were used to before. So you're not gonna be trying to get to a drug that works on millions. Perhaps it's okay for you to find a drug that works on 300,000 patients, as long as <coughs> as long as you can target them and 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 do it in a in a cost-effective and efficient manner. So so I think some of the industry dynamics around around big pharma and around genomic sequencing will uh, will perhaps accelerate how this gets to market, who uses it, and who pays for it. At least that's, that's our perspective. Thank you, Igor. Uh, my next question I'm gonna address, to go back to Vineet, uh, if you're so inclined. What role will analytics play in consumer-directed healthcare, and how will that influence the interaction of consumers with payers and providers? Um, so I think I'll start with a few um, sort of depressing stats, um, given that's a brief session. Uh, there's some data collected that uh, said that we have 1.7 million deaths a year, a trillion dollars in healthcare spend, 100 times more than necessary hospitalizations happen in the U.S. And this is all on the back of a healthcare system that is actually considered world class in terms of the actual technology that we have at our disposal. And a delivery system that could probably be ripped out and replaced if we actually had the choice to do so. I think the insurance companies, uh, there's no insurance companies here, um, 
in the room, um, rank probably a very close second to the IRS in terms of their consumer interaction behavior and how people actually even understand or love them. And that's actually a fundamental problem in terms of what being a consumer in such an environment means to us. Right? So when you think about, we really don't want to be a healthcare consumer. We, we just want to be, uh, we just want to take care of our health the best we can and make sure that we have a good long life, right? Um, dealing with dollars, dealing with money, dealing with reimbursements, dealing with payments, uh, all those things most of us kind of tend to put to, to one side and never really worry about it. So from a standpoint of what we think about analytics, we started um, with a very basic and simple premise um, that most of us need to make sure that when we actually get those bills, make sure when we get those reimbursements and when we get all those requests from doctors about uh, dealing with the, that type of information, we want to make it simple and painless. Make sure that in this new environment where I'm paying more and more for my health care, that we make it as painless as possible for you. So what Health Expense does with third party administrators and care teams is we become their system. Uh, they use our system in the good old fashioned way for processing claims, processing reimbursements, making sure that for you as a individual, you don't have to deal with all this uh, stuff. We make it very simple, easier to consume. And then on top of that, there's a lot of analytics you can run on it, whether it's claims information, whether it's public domain information from Medicare, but really correlating those two to say, uh, we're looking at information that actually looks at all the preventable conditions, all the actual treatment pathways, all the evidence-based uh, uh, protocols to see when and how you should go for care. So simple things like annual checkups, which we can easily identify based on the fact that you haven't been through one. But more complex conditions take a lot of ana ana an analytics. Um, if you're diabetic, what's your treatment protocol? What um, Have you actually been for an eye test? Have you actually gone your gotten your blood draw every three months as you're supposed to? Those things look simple, but if you can follow them through, that has a very, very significant impact on care costs, which which actually goes to reducing those 1.7 million deaths, reducing that trillion dollar in spend. That's really where I think consumer behavior needs to go is to drive better care, removing some of the barriers to getting care and, and really enabling that in a way that doesn't create a big cost hurdle for us. Um, that's, and that's a, the, the last piece is the hardest challenge of all because we are in a situation where we're paying more and more for healthcare. Uh, the average out of pocket has gone up several thousand dollars in the last few years, and we have to find a way to manage that. So, uh, just can you highlight the question one more time? I, I don't oh, want sure. to go off topic. <clears throat> uh, what role will analytic? analytics play in consumer directed healthcare and how will that influence the interaction of consumers with payers and providers yeah so one very uh, 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 Vinik brought up a very good point like uh, the major payers out there uh, the each one of them has huge websites there is an etna.com there is a uhc.com uh, if you compare, if you do some kind of a study, and some of them are our investors, so I know these guys pretty well, uh, they spend they spend a lot of money um, trying to give good care uh, and information on their websites. But historically, what has happened is, and there is no single reason for this, but the amount of, uh, uh, they are not trusted. For some reason, payer websites and payers in general, uh, they have lost trust, and uh, and nobody can really pinpoint why that has, that has happened. Maybe it was uh, because some, you know, there were cases where they didn't pay for some, uh, you know, and then those cases became very big and all, right? But they have always tried. Uh, if you go to an etna.com and see the vast amount of information they do provide over on that website, that's pretty staggering. Um, same with uh, UHC and all. So uh, there is, there are, there are, the other thing which has happened is HIPAA. So HIPAA laws were very onerous for small organizations to become HIPAA compliant. 
So these are very, these, this is the reason why this is not working very well today. But if you put the lack of trust, uh, you know, uh, in, in health plans as one uh, aspect, you take the onerous nature of HIPAA regulations, right? What that hap what that led to, and the third thing is healthcare is episodic. It's not sports, it's not politics, it's not finance. You don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you go to a sports website on a daily basis, you'll probably go to a healthcare-related website on a quarterly basis. At an average, you're gonna to go to a WebMD or a Healthline or whatever it may be, once a month or once every two months when you are sick or a loved one is sick. This is a very big problem, okay? Uh, because to date, uh, because of the way the industry is structured, and frankly, it's it's a case of all of us being a little bit spoiled. It's not it's not bad. We 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 want it this way. We like it this way. That we you know you fall sick, you don't really pay for it. So uh, that's that's what has happened, okay? And um, because of this. If you add now the onerous nature of HIPAA, if you add to it the lack of trust the health plans have, all this thing has created where, frankly, to influence a consumer with any kind of information data has become very, very difficult, okay? So uh, so now uh, the, the industry is changing a little bit where, where uh, health plans are trying to reach out even more to consumers because they understand they have to work closer to the with the ACO model which we were talking about they have to talk, you know play closer to the providers you know all three constituents providers payers and i include hospital systems into the and pharma actually within the provider market and then uh, the consumer they realize this is like trillions of dollars of waste uh, it, it is staggering right like so everybody's realizing that, hey, one day this thing will collapse. We, we need to fix this thing. So, and uh, uh, maybe the consumer consumers are feeling they will pay more out of the pocket. Health plans are feeling that, hey, they will make less profit. Providers feeling they'll lose customer. So all of those three things. And because of that, um, there, is a, there is a real migration towards more openness and everybody relaxing a little bit. Consumers are like, okay, you know what? Not a big deal if some of my personal information gets carried by. Because personalization is very key. When you provide data which is general, that hey, here is breast cancer related data. Or, or, but when you say here is data specific to you for your condition, and you capture that data for that consumer and provide it back or use it back to uh, you know, feed him more information and relevant information, it changes the dynamics dramatically. So consumers are getting a little bit more relaxed that, hey, keep my information, take my information. Health plans are striving to provide more uh, information. Providers are like, you know what, if if my ratings and my cost is more transparently shown to consumers, um, I'm okay with it, okay? So there is a general, you know, feeling of everybody being a little bit more flexible with each other and that's going to lead to improved transparency and wealth for the consumers. Thank you. I think we're, anybody have any follow-ups? Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Um, this, I, talking more about uh, cons consumers and providers and, and, the, and, and how analytics might play, this is my, I infuse, infuse a little optimism, maybe some would say like wildly optimistic, but. I think if, if we buy into the premise that we will um, be gathering more data about, about ourselves, about our bodies going forward, and that there's a need to, to analyze and, and give insight out of this information, one of the things I've been really interested in, if you think about when you, go to the, when you go to the doctor, and then they spend all this time, or spend five minutes or whatever, trying to get to know you or understand what's going on, and then very rapidly give you a, a prescription or a treatment plan or something, and then, and then you're gone. And then you come back in six months, and doctors have this—you know—they're they're essentially very information and data-driven folks. And then they have no information; they have no data. Um, they ask you questions: How did you do? And um, always, you know, I worked with cardiologists a lot, and they'd always, you know, for especially for men, they would love to, if the wife was in the room because they'll get a better report. You know, that everything was going fine. But what about the time when you you almost fainted like two months ago? It's like, oh yeah, yeah, I got lightheaded. I had to sit down. 
guy's like, oh my god, you're hypoglycemic, I gotta change your diabetes meds, I mean. Um, but if we're collecting this information, I think one of the really powerful things that could come of that is it might fill in the gaps for a physician, even tracking activity, right? Even if a doctor had some report of how active the patient was uh, in that six month intervening time, that's a huge amount of information that they didn't have before and might tailor the conversation that they're able to have. What was this spike? What was this dip? And, and start to fill in the gaps in a more objective way. And I think it might even empower the relationship between the patient and the physician where the patient feels really good because now they're a participant. They're bringing something valuable to the table and they're able to, to, to talk and have a conversation about themselves in a very different way with the physician and it frees the physician up to have this higher level of conversation. So that's my optimistic view of how things might, might unfold. Um, if we did start to have some information to fill in that gap, it becomes more of a, you know, less of a paternalistic relationship, more of a, of a, of a partnership, I guess. Um, and, uh, and, and I think both, both parties would be well served. The doctor would be more empowered to give good care and the patient should hopefully be more empowered to um, continue this dialogue, continue the engagement. Well, thank you, Chris. I, um, I'd like to open it up now to the audience, uh, let's see if they have any questions. Thanks. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I'll direct this to Chris. Um, the uh, data that's being accumulated that your company or others are accumulating uh, by vast amounts of healthcare records, and you were even talking about people's cell phones, uh, I would assume that this is somehow aggregated in an anonymous way because of HIPAA. But are you, a, uh, are you permitted to do this sort of research on records without their knowledge? Uh, it's, it's a great question. So the information that we would collect from an individual, right, we would have right to, to use. And that could be through questions we ask them or uh, integrating with services because they're opting in to provide that information. Um, the information that we use from electronic medical records is de-identified. And so we basically use the data today as a raw material. And so we do have rights to use that, and it's very, very de-identified. I mean, it, it, we, don't, we don't care, we don't want to re-identify it. We, um, we're using it in, in an aggregate way. We use it to build models, prediction models, and analytic tools so that we can help uh, understand how to group people um, and how, those, how different groups might behave differently. And then we try to overlay the information that we've collected from an individual uh, to this I guess de-identified aggregate data that we've used um, for analytic purposes to drive some insight. But at any point, does the individual know that their data, even in a de-identified way, is being analyzed uh, in a population study like that? And does HIPAA allow that? Um, HIPAA does allow that, and it it is part of the terms of service of using this this platform, and so. What people know about the terms of service that they've opted into or not is is up for debate, but it is very, very clear and explicit in the terms of service. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, so I think one of the key things we have to understand is that regulation is a 24-month-old reaction to a condition that exists <laughs> today. So whenever lawmakers write legislation, I work with the FDA for a couple of years. Um, they do by committee and it takes a long, you know, it's like the meat making process takes a long time before they actually craft something of real value. So when it comes to HIPAA and particularly privacy legislation, I think my personal view is um, that it's, it's something that was crafted for an industry that existed eight to ten years ago and not one that will exist in the next ten years. What, that, what I mean by that is that the, the, the massive surge of information that's about to come about you that you opt into um, is all going to rest somewhere in different environments that they're not conceived about in you know in the cloud somewhere or in devices somewhere. So uh, they will have to go through a fresh look at that legislation to see how your information is secure. Not necessarily more private, it's more secure. There's a big, big difference because if you make your information private, then it's really just being contained for you and not really useful. But making it secure, making sure that devices can talk to each other, making sure that the intervening period between two visits, a doctor only has 15 minutes uh, to deal with you. So to that critical five minute window when they're actually examining, they need to have the maximum amount of information available about you. So I think privacy and security will 
come back on the front burner in the next few years when the legislators realize that the the law is actually getting outdated literally day by day. So, um. also just follow, I, I think um, in terms of in terms of uh, privacy and risk, I think you know Nirash uh, touched on this, but to date it's all it's I, everything is is risk and benefit, right? And to date it's all risk. There, my information's there. People might get it. We read this in the news, but there's no benefit. And I think when we start to see this wave of personalization that happens, so we're actually using this data to provide a really compelling experience to you, then the risk that you feel starts to get mitigated because I see the benefit of my information being out there. I mean, Eric Schmidt gave a talk a long time ago at Hims where he, he basically used the analogy of, of putting your credit cards online. You know, 10 years ago, everyone would have thought that was the craziest thing in the world. But now people do it every day. You, we all do it without thinking about it. And it's just that the risk-benefit equation changed. Um, people got to know the risk better, or the lack of risk, actually. And the benefit is, is enormous. And I think there'll be a very similar uh, trend where people, you know, does it really, I mean, people have different views of, of what they expect other, or want other people to know. But if they're getting, if they are getting a benefit from it, I think that the, the risk becomes not as, as bleak. Uh, you raised a couple of very interesting points. Who owns the data? Uh, what are the rights? Well, that's that's where you were headed, I'm guessing. So the data, uh, wherever it is stored, whether it's in an EMR or a claim system, so there, are, there are three or four massive areas where data, personal data is stored. Right? One is the EMR, uh, which is when you visit a doctor. And, all right. One is the claims system, which is where you get reimbursed. So those are the two. Uh, primary places, and then if you are, if you have joined Health Ward or something like that, and given some information over there, um, irrespective of where the data is, it's your data. As long as you, it's related to you, it's your condition. It's it, you own that data. That's a very important thing. Um, but during the collection of the data, right? So when when an EMR system receives that data or a claim system that wants to reimburse you for that data. There are some inherent rights they have to use that data, right? Or you have agreed to something like, "Hey, I'm giving, you know, we are taking your test, and we are going to use that test. We are going to send it to another hospital, under the law, uh, under the lab, uh, or another doctor." So that, you know, so if you are a hospital system, you have the rights to do things like, "Who are my diabetes patients?" And I want to do an outreach to them through an email campaign or something. Or IVR campaign or phone camp. So there are some rights which are, but the data is yours. They cannot sell the data. They can use it for your benefit, but they cannot sell the data. So they cannot give that data to a marketing company, you know, who wants a list of diabetes related uh, patients, a list of diabetes, related, or, or to another medical device company or anything. So the, the sale of that data is forbidden. Internal use of that data is allowed. And there is lots of gray areas in this, uh, but in but one thing which is very clear is they can absolutely do what Chris mentioned, like overall research on, a, let's say there are 10,000 records in a EMR system, they can definitely do overall to see trends. Like, hey, am I seeing more flu victims uh, in this zip code? So is there an outbreak of this, you know, well, I never saw a SARS case in 20 years and suddenly I'm seeing 20. So they are allowed to do those kind of studies. So that's the distinction. What they cannot do is sell your data to somebody uh, with your name on it. So that's the biggest. about mechanisms like both health expense 
consolidate that information and, and make it available, not necessarily for insurance company purposes because that's just one payer, but you know, consolidating it across multiple payer types. So um, I think um, I actually have some personal background with uh, Genentech's reimbursement program and the Spock mm -hmm. single point of contact. Uh, it's probably one of the best known programs for those folks who don't know about how a very expensive drug like you know, Elastin can be made available to people who have limited means at their disposal and don't really need that kind of um, medication to, to sustain their life or to actually in, in, you know, increase their lifespan. The reason I bring that up is that um, when it comes to reimbursement, the end goal it's not to reimburse the provider more or to, um, you, you know, to make the insurance company profits go lower or higher. The end goal is that we need to figure out a mechanism so that you and I can get uninterrupted and unimpeded access to care. That's the most important thing, because until we get that access to care, we're not going to bring costs down. So from a standpoint of what we look at, and if hopefully I answer that question, is that when we start to collect data about reimbursements and payments um, from high deductible plans, the first thing we're doing is making sure that it's collected over a period of time, that the administrator who's reimbursing those bills on your behalf, um, or you are, as your paying providers, that builds up over time, doesn't matter which health plan you're in, doesn't matter which kind of provider you're seeing. So it's really building up like your cost history. Sounds pretty basic, uh, but it gives a tremendous amount of an insight into conditions in terms of how we can then predict or analyze information just about you to say, uh, what kind of conditions do you have? Uh, who's, who, your dependents, what, what age they are in, what kind of incentives we can provide to you to get access to better care. So I think across providers is a norm because typically most of us change health plans every three years. The, the, the missing gap for us is really that, in, that part in the middle where what's the actual, beyond the conditions, how are you maintaining your health? How do you get into the, uh, the mindset of the individual about wellness? Uh, we can look at preventive care using claims data. We can look at conditions using EMR data if that's at our disposal. Um, we don't look at that personally. Um, but really, how do you quantify the behavior of the individual in terms of how they're accessing healthcare? That's, that's, a, key, uh, that's a key gap, so. Thank, thank you, Vineet. We're running low on time. Maybe one or two more questions. David? So I have a question on uh, providing DNA-based data, and maybe people could, could start on this. The, my, my observation is that let's say that we get to the Holy Grail in April of this year, okay, and the first machine is released that can do a $1,000 genome uh, scan. I believe that that's not going to change anything because you also need the data which shows that for a particular condition that a patient has that here are the <coughs> correlations with this genome and I don't except for a, a very small number of cases I don't believe that data exists today and I know that to obtain that data for any particular case it takes years you know uh, certainly more than a year of, of work so to, to obtain generally applicable well take 10 or 15 years following the holy grail on the equipment side um, having been achieved so tell me I'm wrong uh, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd much rather see this thing uh, be producing value but I think that this is very bad news for companies who'd like to make money out of that space and, and, and you invest in companies so I'd like to no, no, your point is, point is well taken, uh, but if you look at the trend of, you know, how many patients, you know, how, how much data we have now available uh, that is uh, publicly available for patients, you know, the growth is pretty, pretty dramatic, right? So it'll be about, uh, you know, a little under a million patients for which we will have that detailed data available, not just about their sequence, but also the conditions and you know the 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 conditions that that uh, uh, DNA could apply to, 
and the projections are that it would be in the uh, tens of millions in the next four to five years, right? So, so in some sense, you're relying on the ecosystem to move just as fast as the sequencing companies are moving. And, and one thing, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's very hard to extrapolate from, from the past, as you know. You know, once, once you reach a tipping point, and in some sense, this is a bet on the tipping point, right? Once the cost of this has come down this far, and with all the other pressures that are out there on the industry, will the industry, is the industry incentivized to move just so much faster than they have in the past? So you now see companies like J&J in becoming venture capitalists themselves and actually pooling money to invest in these early stage drug discovery uh, molecular targeting companies that will start to use some of this genomics data, right? So, so in some sense, it's a bet on human genuity, uh, it's, it's a bet on capitalism, and it's a bet on some of the tailwinds that the industry is facing, right? But, you know, but, but it is a risky business, right? We would, you know, if this were, if, if we had a line of sight, if we had a line of sight, uh, you know, I'd be buying public market stocks and not investing in venture venture back startups. So. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add one more thing. You are right that it's it's there is sequencing in this, comparing the sequence with existing sequenced. So that's that's the challenge, the the comparison. So the sequencing, if if the machines are released and they can get it down to a thousand dollars, the the catch is how do you compare that sequence of this of you or me with existing sequences out there, uh, which can show a profile for a particular, you know, a, uh, you know, propensity towards a particular disease or something like that, right? So that, uh, so for that you need the you need the metadata, which is basically previously sequenced uh, genomes for different uh, conditions or something. Like that. And uh, uh, there are so. You know, there was an HGI, Human Genome, and Insight, and now there are tens of such companies which have done that. And you can actually now, they're, they're trying to figure out how to segment the sequences. So, you know, the, the 23 chromosomes and the different genes, how do you segment them? So if, if the next step is going to be like, how do you segment it to individual portions of the genome, uh, and then do comparison only for those portions? So yes, it is some time away, but it's not 15 years they will get it done in the next few years. So. One, one last question. Yes, please. Um, yeah, um, so I'm Melinda Cuthbert, and I, uh, I'm a consultant um, and a systems theorist, but uh, I think my point is really, I'm interested in the ecosystem. I wanna pick up on the ecosystem and also on the correlations, because I think one of the most exciting things for me in looking at, having looked at data for 20 plus years, is the shift away from, I mean, the wonderful thing personalization does is allow you to focus now on changes in patterns of symptoms. Um, and before we had to have causality, and causality is really diff difficult, and that's part of the problem with genomics. I had a proteomics biomarker company five years ago that I basically put on hold to pursue a different way of looking at data, and I think all of us need to be um, kind of e-health architects and really think about the whole, you know, um, industry and where the capabilities are to, to develop or extract the data that you're looking for, whether it's sensor-based to get all of this quantified self, or whether it's payments-based, and I think maybe that's the area that the most creative work's being done. But I'd be interested in hearing from the panelists what they think, what capability they think needs to be developed to really help their product leapfrog. I think, um, so sound clip, I think we need all of it to work together to really give a solid response, but that's not commercially viable, right? Um, in, a, in, a, in a industry that's trillions of dollars and, and most of it wasteful, um, in my personal opinion, um, really none of us, and I, I think I would hazard a guess to say, even if we become very large billion dollar companies are going to fully address the problem that exists before us. We can solve the payment problem and the choice problem by personalizing some aspect of your information. We can solve the quantified self problem and um, by picking up all the data about you, we can look at 
um, genomic sequencing, but the, at the end of the day, when it comes down to you and me, we need all of this to come together in a way, and that is really the fundamental issue. I don't think, um, I, my personal view is that genomic sequencing, if you look at it as a straight line, yes, it's 10, 15 years down the line, but most advances in medical technology have happened as an accident of one thing being there that led to some other discoveries. So I don't see genomic sequencing as being a 15 year time span that will result in the perfect human being and you know disease free individuals. It will probably come up with some advances three years down the line that we will say, wow, okay. But I think the integration of these individual capabilities is really where we will actually benefit. So we should be able to come together in a way in the future where we can not only look at money and conditions, look at the interaction at the physician's office, and look at quantify itself in a meaningful way and, and bring that together, so. Yeah, I, I agree. That's the, the biggest trend that's helped us out. I mean, I, I've been thinking about ideas like this um, for, for a number of years, and I never had, every, everything that we want to do is data-driven. We never had the raw material um, to, to play with, and now all of a sudden I have you know data from electronic medical records, and I have these great data sets from, from the government that um, Todd Park and his group have, have cleaned up enough to where they're almost usable. Um, and then, and then um, quantified itself-ish tracker data, you know, with companies that we're partnering with who have vast amounts of this data. And so now for the first time, we can put all of this stuff together and, and actually analyze it without having to wait until we have 100,000 users on our product. You know, we can give an experience to that first user because we have this reference data. Um, and, but the one shift, I guess, is something that that we'll, we'll focus on too is, to, to your point, of the power of, of an understanding where the power and where the pitfalls are of correlation. You, know, you won't hear me make a lot of causation arguments. We just don't have the data for that. But I still do believe with, with data this, this big, with this number of records, we can correct for a lot of things. And correlations, especially around behavior, you know, maybe not drug impact or something, but around behaviors, correlation is very, very interesting. And so we're really interested in finding unique and kind of random correlations um, that, that do to help us gain insight into, into a person or a population's behavior and how that might impact uh, other aspects of health. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think we're out of time. So uh, a little show of hands for that.